Yeah. So yeah, we need a Netflix special, man. The Zoom King. Mark, Zoom that's King. you, man. Zoom <laughs> King. That's your bag. So I go out at 3 a.m. to get milk products or something. <laughs> no, what would we get at 3 a.m.? What would Mark show up with? You get the call and go, hey, man, here's what happened. No, he's out stealing ring lights. That's what it is. And conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. That would be beautiful. The parody was fantastic, wasn't it? I thought she was oh, adorable. Was great, oh, she that was perfect. Like the amount of work that went into that. Yeah. yeah. Bless her heart. And, and, and good work as well. Like her, she was on point. Like that whole thing of Mark with your hand like, up like that, was, man. Yeah. And what? Chase is, all she did was blink the whole time, <laughs> time for Chase. She kept going, Do I have a high blink rate on some of these videos? No, but you talk know. about it. That's, your, that's one of yours, <laughs> man. Oh, okay. so she was sitting there doing the high blink rate the whole time. Then she did that for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah, it's been like almost a week since we've seen each other. I, I missed you guys. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We ready? Yeah. There we go. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst. And I trained law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the bodylanguagetactics.com course with Greg Hartley. And I wrote Understanding Body Language, my first book. Everybody else on this panel has about 14,000 books that have all been to number one. So hopefully I'll be able to get mine there too. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I put together this course with Scott, bodylanguagetactics.com. I have 10 books on body language and behavior, and I spend most of my time on Wall Street and, and in corporate America. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I'm an author of fiction and nonfiction books, both on behavior, body language, and that kind of stuff. I train the U.S. military intelligence agencies in behavioral tactics influence and persuasion and behavioral profiling. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. I've got four books on human behavior and body language, but I'm really looking forward to Scott's. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Usually when you see somebody who's lying, and especially women, when they see somebody they know fairly quickly because of the way their brain works compared to the way men's brains work. They're, they're much more powerful when it comes to spotting what's happening. So when you see these things, you know something's wrong, but you're just not sure what. We're, you're going to see, you're going to know something's wrong here, but we're going to show you what's wrong. We're going to tell you what's wrong. We're going to tell you what you're seeing. Now we got this, this video a suggestion. Greg and I had seen a long time ago, but this girl Natasha sent it to us and said, hey, you might like this. So that's why, so, so we'd forgotten about it. So that's what we're going to do today. Again, we're not going to be telling you whether this person is lying or not, but what we're going to be doing is just pointing out the things they're doing. So you'll have a better understanding of what you're seeing when you start seeing things like this, when someone's being dis dishonest or, or deceptive with you. Anybody got anything? Nope. This is a great one. All right. Let's go to the first one. We're on the record. The time now is 2.41 p.m. in the matter of Deborah Ann Frazier versus Ricky Allen Frazier, case number 2010-773215-DM. There's a videotaped deposition of David E. Taylor being taken at 2055 Orchard Lake Road, Sylvan, Michigan. Today is November 12, 2014. My name is Ed Boyke, legal videographer. Counsel, please introduce themselves to the record. Colleen Renane appearing on behalf of Rick Frazier. Jerry Cavalier on behalf of David E. Taylor. Steve Jenkins appearing on behalf of Deborah Frazier. Gregory Tuma on behalf of Rick Frazier. Please have the witness form. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So okay. Yes. Since we're going to be winding up with you a lot, Mark, why don't you go first this time? Yeah, lovely. Uh, let me give you uh, a couple of things. One of them is succession of behaviors. The first one is single behavior. I want you to look out for the chewing that he's doing on either side of the mouth, pretty much probably digging his teeth into his cheek. Uh, that is quite particular and synonymous often with anxiety, uh, probably a self-stimulation behavior. He can't control what's going on around him, but he can control the chewing that he does on the side of his mouth. mouth. It's, it's a kind of a pacifier gesture, I would suggest. Does that suggest he's lying no people can pacify in this way for all kinds of reasons but it's certainly one to look out for here's the big succession of gestures that for me denotes okay we've got to really look at this one there's really something going on he goes from water 
to a steepling gesture in his thumbs, which drop very quickly, that then go to an adapter somewhere on his trousers and then back to a steeple that drops again. Do any one of those single things suggest somebody is lying? No, but all of them in such quick succession is very particular to see. So again, when I see that chewing, when I see that succession of what I would now say are probably all of them adapters, even the steepling as well, I would say, is him trying to control the environment by trying to feel confident and then realizing, don't feel so confident, you better adapt here, mm, that's not working for me, better go back to here, still don't feel very confident. So individually, they can mean nothing. In, in a group and in succession, in what we call a cluster, very definitely we want to look out for those. Scott, what do you got for us? All right. This is one of my favorites of all time because he's just, this is just a, like you said, a succession of, of adapters. That's pretty much all we're seeing in this part. So when he drink, takes a drink of water, he's not drinking water because he's thirsty. He's drinking water because he wants something to do. He's nervous. This isn't his first day doing this. I think this is day two of his, uh, of the um, deposition. So he's, he's just doing that to do something. And that's when he starts getting nervous. Then you see his hand when it unscrews the, uh, top of the bottle if you look at his fingernails he has the same hands as a four thousand year old vampire overlord i mean <laughs> it's incredible long fingernails you don't see that very often his blink rate goes up in groups depending on what she's talking about like he does i think four or five in a row at one point it's really uh fascinating and every time she starts talking about money as we go through this you'll see that blink rate go way up uh, his mouth chewing, like Mark was saying earlier, a lot of times it it's it, he's chewing on it'll be chewing on his cheek, but a lot of it I think is his bottom lip is what it looks like. That's why he keeps pushing this way. But then it comes back to the other one. It's it's when you speed it up, it's hilarious. Uh, his voice tone is really quiet, especially when he says yes, because he's a preacher, he's a pastor, and she said, "Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing about the truth?" So help you God, and he says yes, almost a whisper of yes. So I get, that's called fading facts, but there's nowhere to fade to because he's he's at the very bottom of the fade. He's just about to go out at that point. So uh, Chase, what do you got? Agreed on all these parts, especially the fingernails. It's all this. <laughs> so with this lip biting is absolutely anxiety. We see this chewing, then lip licking behavior and lip retraction. So with deception, a couple of those data points are lip compression is usually, or as Scott would say, suggests or denotes withheld opinions. Lip retraction suggests or denotes typically a need for reassurance. And we see the blink rate is, is kind of steady at 28 for the entire video, but he has little clusters and the clusters appear at the moments when he feels a little bit threatened. If you go back and take a look, or if you yell at your dog, you'll see the dog do the same thing. Uh, sad that Mark didn't talk about peaches for this. <laughs> I but never see, yell at peaches. We'll see this. <laughs> in in uh, threat behavior, is this? It's I want to make eye contact in case I'm attacked, but I'm going to break it as much as possible with with my eyelids instead. So that's, that's that behavior there. And the blink rate slows down as the conversation focuses to him. And they're saying, he's here, let's introduce the witness. The blink rate slows down and this is anticipation of threat or a potential anticipation of a threat. And when he's swearing in, there's lip compression before and lip compression immediately after he says yes at the very tail end of the video so i would say there's a very good chance that there is some deception going on here greg what do you got yes yeah, so i'm not going to cover the same things you covered i may cover pieces of them but fight or flight has kicked in with this guy and scott you said it best this guy is used to being in charge he's in front of a big crowd he's a big name he's a he's not here and we'll see that he is out of his place here and you'll start to see fight or flight. When he picks up the bottle, I agree with you. There's one thing, he's doing the sacred space thing. Mark, I love you captured that, but the sacred space is I got my hands in front of me and I'm doing something with them. That's a way to take back some space and take some control, make myself comfortable, whatever it is. 
And I always refer to that as sacred space because it gives a person room to, to think and a way to soothe self. Then he moves to the where he has the bottle and he takes the cap off. Look at his hands. They're trembling. My favorite good indicator somebody's uncomfortable when they're in an interview, when they are being in a deposition or anything else is how they set the bottle down and they watch it make contact with the table because their hand is jittery and they want to make sure they set it down. Love that. I've seen people do it in job interviews. If you are in this position and you are being interviewed, don't pick up the bottle if you're that uncomfortable. Do yourself a favor. If you're interviewing somebody and you see them that uncomfortable and they move the glass and you want to make them comfortable, mirror that behavior. Do the same thing with your glass. You'll bring them back to some kind of grounding. Remember that fight or flight is trying to turn off our thinking brain, turn off that that prefrontal cortex or the primate portion of our brain and turn us back into other mammals like cats. And that's what's happening here. You see the blink rate increase. You see him starting to do things to try to get comfortable. If you can remember that that's happening to you and feel it when you're being interviewed, then you take control again. Curl your toes in your shoes, move your leg in, in your chair, do something comforting that's not within sight, unlike what he did here. It's all, all the fight or flight starting to hit. And I think it's, you're right, Scott, this is day two. And we'll see it get better as time goes. But we're not talking about whether he's lying. We're talking about indicators. We see clusters of behavior that indicate he is feeling apprehensive. Doesn't mean he's lying. As we always say, there's no indicator, no single indicator. But something's going on in his head that is not above board is what we're seeing here. That's what I've got. And one Excellent. more thing. You're about to watch this clip again. And just like we talked about those thumbs that are going up down here, I want you to watch when they introduce opposing counsel, they introduce members of the court, the fingers go down. The moment his attorney is mentioned, you'll see them pop back up for a brief moment. Then they introduce someone else in the court and they go back down. And Chase, that steepling thing you're talking about, I always say, if you steeple, do away with it. Because when you're in control and you're steepling, you'll do this. But as you compromise, your hands rotate forward and then your thumbs will rotate down. And Mark, I'll have to find that picture of Tony Blair standing in front of Condoleezza Rice with his hands like this. <laughs> it's just yeah. the most powerless look you can possibly have. We're on the record. The time now is 2.41 p.m. In the matter of Deborah Ann Frazier versus Ricky Allen Frazier, case number 2010-773215-DM. There's a videotaped deposition of David E. Taylor being taken at 2055 Orchard Lake Road. Sylvan, Michigan, today is November 12, 2014. My name is Ed Boyke, legal videographer. Counsel, please introduce themselves to the record. Colleen Renane appearing on behalf of Rick Frazier. Jerry Cavalier on behalf of David E. Taylor. Steve Jenkins appearing on behalf of Deborah Frazier. Gregory Utuma on behalf of Rick Frazier. Please have the witness for him. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear, firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So, okay. Yes. All right. Ready to go? Yep. Yeah, let's move on. All right, so what is your salary at JMMI now? From what I know, I... I From what you know? Yeah, I think it's around twenty seven to 30000 something like that. And what expenses are you saying that JMMI pays on your behalf? Um, well, it's the expenses under the law for clergy. So, so what are they? I don't know. You have to go research that. I, no, I can't tell you. No. I, I, don't I don't know everything. There is no research I can do that will tell me what JMMI is paying for you. Well, what I'm saying is we abide by those laws, so that's that's where it would be, so. Oh, no, no, it's, sir. I'm just saying, I can't you, tell you, I don't know. You have no idea what expenses JMMI pays for I know a housing you. allowance. I How know much that. is that? Um, I'm not sure, don't know. What other allowance? Um, there's, I, I don't want to misstate, so I, I, I don't know. I'd rather for someone who's professional tell you about that. No, I'm asking about your personal, not in theory. What's but you're some, asking no, about sir, ministry let stuff. Let me finish. I'm answering let, you. No, don't don't interrupt. Let me finish the question. Okay. Chase, what do you got? This is great. I mean, we were watching this. Uh, so what we do here on the panel, we keep the Zoom recording rolling, and then we all watch the video together through Scott's computer. 
And we're all giggling the whole time watching this, which you guys can't see behind the scenes because it's such a great clip. And uh, there's when he's thinking about his expenses, we don't see recall. We see internal dialogue, eye movement here. And when he's saying, what are they? Asking a, a, a question again, we see eyebrow flash, shoulder shrug. And this does, he does this three more times as she's pressing him on the question. And then when he's saying housing allowance, there's false confusion there, pretending uh, to be confused. And I'll just do uh, one more. When he says, I'm not sure, it's micro, but there's duping delight. You can see the face be very, he's very satisfied with, with his performance. And he knows, like, I've just said, I don't know, or I'm not sure to a question. And that's it. I can, that's a legal answer. And for an interrogator, that's our worst nightmare. I don't know is the hardest, uh, or I don't remember is the hardest thing for interrogators to overcome. Well, I'll speak for myself. And then we see the blink clusters I talked about just a second ago. We see it again as she starts really coming down on him towards the end of this one clip. And Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. So I, I agree, Chase. Like he's getting more confident as he goes on there, as he's starting to use those, my guess is, what the lawyers have told him to say. He gets more confident. I didn't see the Dupas delight. So I'm gonna go back and take a take a look at that. Cause I I if you saw it, I guarantee that's that's gonna be there. Uh so I, I wanna go back and see that one. And anybody watching right now, go back and take a look uh, as well. I'm really interested in, in that one. Because Dupas delight, like you hear it talked about a lot, but we've always got to go back and, and go, what is it, what does it look like? Because it can be quite subtle and it can be confused for other things. So let's go back and look at that one for sure. Uh, uh, here's what I pick up on as well. Oh, exactly as you're saying as well, Chase, the the, the pretend confusion there. You know, again, it, it's not it's not prolonged and sustained enough to be consistent, constant confusion. It just kind of shows up when he hasn't got a good answer for it and disappears when he's got his lawyer's answers for it. Um, I love how he goes from from what I know to I know I don't know. There's lots of, of flip-flopping between what you know and what you don't know. Linguistically, he's not making any sense at all. Uh, you'll notice him rocking backwards and forwards right at the start as well. Self-soothing gesture, in my opinion, there. And then the last one, the 27 to 30K uh, of what he thinks his salary might be. We get the bitter taste in his mouth. There's something that he knows is distasteful about what he just said there. There's just too many red flags here to, yeah. to suggest that he's telling the truth or he's innocent. Greg, what have you got? Yeah, so I'm gonna go away from body language because you covered most of it. I'm gonna go to something else, great indicator. People when they're lying or they're hiding the truth often will insulate the truth in something holy. He just did it. You know, holy, high, you know, high ground as my mother's my witness or on my mother's grave, that kind of thing. He called in the clergy immediately. These are things that the clergy gets. And so if when that didn't work, he went to law just as good. OK, there's also a statutory obligation. So he's coding the truth with this so he doesn't have to divulge it. These are things you wouldn't understand. This is the clergy. This is a government regulation. We follow the rules. Does that have anything to do with the question? Absolutely not. So he's distancing from the question. If forced to answer, he does. And he has his forehead up in request for approval when he's doing it. So yeah, all the body language aside, all the breathing, all the respiration, all the change in tone as he goes to a lighter voice, or when he thinks he has authority and tells her he doesn't have to answer it and she, or she can go do it herself and she comes back at him, different game. But all these word patterns tied to all the body language you've all mentioned this is red flag red flag red flag and so you just want to you know you this is one of those guys you don't even want to waste your time pretending that you believe him you just want to sit and look at him and let him paint himself into a corner scott what do you got mine's gonna be fairly short <laughs> sorry <laughs> um because when i when i first saw this this part and it's classic because it comes right after that when he gets sworn in he uh, his answers a couple of questions then he begins and, and you guys get ready for this because you go ah oh, I, I can't believe i didn't bring this up so I, that's why i was kind of bummed out because i figured you guys were going to nail this right out of the gate but what you, what you see him do his hands come down they guard his groin area those shoulders come forward he comes forward a little bit trying to guard 
his heart and his lungs and his stomach doing that number as his, as his shoulders come forward, that head goes down, guard that neck and he starts turtling. And that's the very first thing you see most of the time when someone is not telling the truth and you start asking them questions. First thing we do is what do you, what do you, you know, what those eyebrows go up request for approval. And then that you start from there and you've got to get them open back up. She's not interrogating him here. So it's a completely different uh, situation but he does the classic moves of bringing everything forward and getting and going down like this or the opposite of that is when they're getting ready to tell you everything for example in a murder you'll see him start rocking and they'll get opened up a little bit and that's when you reach over and you touch on the leg blah 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 like we've talked about before um what else have i got in here i think yeah the, and, and originally i thought that nose scratch was was part of eye blocking, but I think it's just a, just another adapter. So that's, so that, that's one of the number one things people learn when they first start body languages. If you scratch your nose, yeah. it means you're lying because it, yeah. there's so many blood vessels and everything in your nose that it is sensitive, but that's the number one overdone absolute I've ever heard is people constantly yeah. talking about that. I think it, it yeah. stems from a research, of course, I'm going to bring this up. But it stems from a research that was done at a university where some dude in a lab coat read questions off a clipboard and they said, you you need to lie to question 11 or whatever that, that was. And nose scratching or facial touching was the number one indicator of deception that they noticed. But it's what they didn't fail. They failed to tell us it's the number one indicator of deception. When you tell someone to be deceptive, the stakes are low. And it's a college kid in a completely safe environment, knowing that there's some idiot with a clipboard in front of you. <laughs> so there's some, so some asterisks in that situation for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So what is your salary at JMMI now? From what I know, I, I from what you know. Yeah, I think it's around twenty-seven to thirty thousand, something like that. And what expenses are you saying that JMMI pays on your behalf? Um, well, it's the expenses under the law for clergy. So, so what are they? I don't know. You have to go research that. I, no, I can't tell you. No. I, I, don't I don't know everything. There is no research I can do that will tell me what JMMI is paying for you. Well, what I'm saying is we abide by those laws, so that's that's where it would be so oh, no, no it's sir i'm just saying i can't you, tell you i don't know you have no idea what expenses jam i know a housing allowance I how much that. is that um i'm not sure don't know what other allowance um there's i, I don't want to misstate so I, I i don't know i'd rather for someone who's professional to tell you about that well, no, I'm asking about your personal, not in theory. What's but some, you're asking no, about sir, ministry me stuff. Let me finish. I'm answering let, you. No, don't don't interrupt. Let me finish the question. Okay. Okay. That's good. Yeah. 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 All right, let's move along. What personal allowances JMM Ministry provides you, or stipends for uh, housing or, or automobile or whatever? What do they provide you? You know, I I know there are many allowances, but one that I can say is housing allowance, but in order for you to get the accurate names for what they allow, you have to talk to a professional. Because I, I don't want to give you misinformation. No, I'm not asking in theory what is possible. I'm asking what actually JMMI provides to you. Objection asked and answered and he ask said you. he doesn't it's know. Not, it's non-responsive. I just don't know. I'm just telling you the okay. truth. Okay, well that's an answer, but that's not what you told me before. Um, all right, well, I'll go first on this one. Uh, again, here he begins with his mouth adapters again, starts chewing on his mouth as they go along. And then he scoots back in his chair and he literally braces himself for this answer because it's almost like somebody's throwing stuff at him verbally, as cornball as that sounds, because he scoots back and he's starting to get ready. And, he, and, it's, and as he does that, his arm comes up, his right, his right arm comes up almost as a barrier uh, for those things as well. Um, then when he starts using his illustrators, they're really slow as he's using these things. And he, as he goes forward, he's like this and this. And then when he's finished, when he's had, when he said, that's enough. He brings it back forward and you hear it hit his lap. 
So that's the way he's using his illustrators in that point. So what we're seeing here, just so you'll know, when someone is being deceptive, a lot of times you'll always hear, oh, they move back away from deception. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. But in this case, he is, as he braces himself to start to start giving his, I want to say something cuss word answer, but he's start giving his, his deceptive answer. So Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so he's still doing the shrinking target, the Uncle Fester look, you know, his head's still kind of shrunken down into his body. But he also, when she starts to ask the question, his face does recognition, something he's prepared to defend against. And you see him almost look happy for a minute. And then he does the request for approval and he does that pushing away with you're talking about with his hand as he sits back. There's not, I'm, I'm not gonna cover a whole lot of body language here. As he works through the mechanics of all these questions, he also then is going about chaff and redirect. He's dumping a lot of words that have no meaning and hoping she'll pick up on one so he can move in the other direction. There's not a lot of content, anything he says. His voice tone goes to really soft because if I tell a lie and it's low, maybe you won't hear. And you hear that in people a lot. When a person's telling you something is not true and they guard and they go to the lower voice and they, they get lighter and they're leaning in so you can hear them, that's all them trying to deceive you. I listen when someone's changing tone, something is up, something's changed in their head when their volume level changes. People who are masterful at managing the situation will use that to draw you in closer. In this case, I think it's more of a, if I don't say it out loud, then I'm not gonna be held accountable. And then the, I don't know, and all of those typical ways of avoiding questions. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so the brain loves predictability and autonomy, the, the ability to make decisions. When it's in an environment where it's unpredictable to it and it doesn't feel like it has a lot of power to decide what's going on, levels of dopamine reduce. And dopamine is the neurotransmitter that says to the brain, hey, things are going to get good. We, we, we've got some good expectations out of this. So the brain gets really kind of depressed. So we use adapters. We like to manipulate the world around us simply so the brain goes, hey we've got a lot of choice here I can I can move my jacket hey I can shift how I'm sitting right now that causes the brain to get optimistic so we adapt when we want the world to get better for us and we want to feel better he does this massive adapter which is this big shift in the chair because he's under pressure and he wants to feel better i would say in this particular circumstance it kind of works quite well for him because i think he gets just that little bit more confident when he's made this big move. So we might get distracted by the confidence. We might go, hey, I think these answers are going pretty well. Maybe he's being honest because look at how confident he feels. But we've got to put it in the perspective of such a massive adapter beforehand and how that may have triggered him into feeling a lot more confident when his answers really have that same resonance of untruthfulness uh, about them. Uh, who have we got next? Chase? Yep. Thanks, Mark. And deliberate adapters are one of the key unclassified things that they teach in resistance to interrogation school. Can't talk about which ones. Uh, maybe Greg is more familiar with what we can't talk about, but <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you can make deliberate adapters a part of a actual strategy to increase confidence and, and comfort. We see some seat adjustment here, and this is really common. Anybody who's, okay, I'm kind of prepared for this, but I need to adjust to, to deliver this. There's fake innocence here. Fake innocence. I'll just call it that. It's kind of like my clarinet hold. And this is, uh, you see eyebrow flash and nodding for approval at the same time. So there's some fake. And he's saying, I'm telling you the truth. And as he's saying, telling you the truth, he's, his head nods harder and his eyebrows go up to force an agreement behavior from the other person. So that's kind of, he's requesting or forcing the other person to nod because he's doing that so much. And that's, I'll leave it at that. What personal allowances JMM ministry provides you or stipends for uh, housing or, or automobile or whatever, what do they provide you? You know, I I know there are many allowances, but one that I can say is housing allowance. But in order for you to get the accurate names for what they allow, you have to 
talk to a professional because I, I don't want to give you misinformation. No, I'm not asking in theory what is possible. I'm asking what actually JMMI provides to you. Objection asked and answered and he said you. he doesn't it's know. Not, it's no. non-responsive. I just don't know. I'm just telling you the okay. truth. Okay, well that's an answer, but that's not what you told me before. Um, who drives the Bentley? Mm, my driver. Who's your driver? Um, I have a number of drivers. So you would say um, James or Cliff, uh, and they're responsible for picking up our um, our guests in those cars that fly in for meetings and things like that. And the same thing with the 2007 Mercedes-Benz? Yes. 2008 BMW? Yes. Are those owned outright or subject to any kind of loan? Uh, they're owned. Outright? There's no loan on those? No. Okay. When you come to Michigan. Right. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'll try not to steal everything here, guys. This is a mess. First of all, how do you answer a question when what he stumbles into something he shouldn't have by trying to be a little vague in the process? He's trying to just avoid her question and says, <laughs> who drives it and she says, and he says, my driver. And then he's like, uh oh, I got four drivers. Now this is starting to make me look more wealthy than I would be. So he starts to do all kinds of things. He does a lip compression, which for me is the same thing you call a lip grip or whatever. I, I call it lip grip, other people call it lip compression. That can be containing data or emotion. It's information one way or the other. His blink rate goes through the roof. He does this, he crosses his body and adapts Again, sacred space, he barriers with his arm and scratches his leg, tries to make it look comfortable. He is licking his lips. All that fight or flight is coming up. So he knows he's in a bind and he's lowered his voice. His volume is down. Guys, this is red flag. Anybody, anybody who studied any body language at all would be able to recognize all those. Does it mean he's lying? No, but it certainly means there's something inside his little head that is causing this stress. The amygdala has recognized the threat and his body is responding. That's what we look for as red flags. And then the fact he's being not forthcoming with information and you have to pull his teeth to get the information is a great indicator that he's being deceptive. Scott, what do you got? Well, I had everything you had. So I've got about two things left. <laughs> uh, we'll start with, uh, oh, I know. We'll go when, when he starts giving up too much information. For some, he just starts telling her about all of his drivers. She says, who drives that car? She just said, Cliff or James, either one of those. But he starts, but then he says, and Mark, I'm probably stealing this. Uh, she, well, I'll talk about it. I'll do a little part of it. He says, so you should say, and that's when he starts talking about, um, or you would say, instead of giving the answer, he doesn't say, well, it's this, this, here's what they do. He said, you would say they do this. So he's, he's just subconsciously back there. He wants her to, to to believe and to say that they that what they're doing is picking up people at the airport and bringing them to the house for these meetings. Because when he starts talking about that, um, when he starts talking about the various tax, tasks they perform, that's when he starts moving his arm, scratching his ankle, then bringing that arm across. Um, when he starts talking about when what they do is when they pick up our guests and bring them to the house for meetings, every time you can see his eyes, he, he eye blocks at that point, slowly. I mean, it takes while his eyes close when he's talking about those things. So he's, again, like Greg said, he's embarrassed about that because he knows he's, he's saying way too much at that point. I think it's dawned on him because they're not having meetings at that house. Have you, have you seen that place? Holy smokes, man. It's like a castle over there and they're going over there. Who knows what they're doing, but it's, they're not having meetings. If it's meetings, they're in the pool and one of those little flo floating pool bars that they have. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to eat up too much Mark stuff. Mark, no, wait, uh, Chase, what do you got? I think there's some internal dialogue here at the beginning. We see him looking down and it's, it's a question that requires zero cognitive effort. Who drives your car? It, I could ask anybody, if I ask you watching right now, you, you wouldn't have to go, uh, well, me. And then think about it a little bit. So this is internal dialogue. How do I manage this? How do I shape the situation? And we see a really great tiny micro expression of disgust. The moment the woman says 2008 
BMW. And you can learn about those micro expressions at bodylanguagetactics.com. I actually went to the course that is in there. <laughs> and there is overt, the most amazingly overt display of lip licking as a hygienic gesture that I've ever seen here. This, that it is just wetting his entire lips to change the appearance. So any hygienic gesture is designed to make you look better. And they are, most of them, a deception indicator, which means we need to stack those things up like Legos to become something that resembles deception. But removing lint from your clothing, licking your lips, pulling your hair back behind your ears, sitting up a little bit straighter, adjusting your clothing, all those are hygienic gestures. And that lip licking is another one there. We see a great example of that. And I'll leave it at that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. So you might think, okay, Mark can't have anything by now, but this is so packed that even though they've been through everything, there's still some more. Uh, look, when she says who drives the Bentley, I think we see freeze at that point. I think we see a moment of freeze. And then I think we see an eyebrow raise of recognition there. He's acknowledging that She's got him on this one. I don't think he was expecting this one, which is why I think he's so long in coming up with these answers because I don't think he thought this one was coming along. And this one is quite poignant. And here's why. When he gets to, as Scott was saying, uh, guest meetings and things like that. What do you mean things like? What do you mean things like that? Like what? Like what, I'd be asking, when you say things like that, what kind of things are you talking about? Because his hand immediately goes back here and starts scratching, which for me is a red flag of let's talk about things like that. Scott, I didn't know about the swimming pool and the car, and the, but in my mind, I was going, I wonder who I these guests are. Yeah, who are these guests? Mm -hmm. How many guests? How often? Guests to what? So... He knows that there is something to be dug into there that he doesn't want revealing. And then we get, uh, so there's no loans on these. At that point, I believe what I see is him checking for the exits. Yeah, he is looking to do a runner. <laughs> now, now he's, it's a pincer movement. They've got him on all sides. His breathing increases, his adapters increase at this point. There's something around these vehicles and what arrives in these vehicles, I think, and what these are used for that I think is a super hot point of this. I don't know what it is. I'd quite like to go and investigate right now and see what it is, but, but it really uh, raises to a crescendo here. So that's, that's what I got. And one thing to your point, Mark, I was hoping one of you guys would say it, but I think he cannot resist an opportunity to show status. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And yep. that's the reason he said, I have many drivers, not two, okay. not three, many. And you'll so see many, I can't even talk about it right now. You'll see it again, because because that's why he did in the last thing, he had this big, grandiose, everything he's going to do is a little too grandiose, even though he's trying to hide it because that recognition, I think, to this guy yeah. matters, right? Yeah. Hey, and Greg, we, talk about... If we're using an interrogation technique, I would do pride into ego down, where I say, well, you're really kind of a second-rate preacher. I bet you make, you know, 20 cents a week. You get change in your plate. And, you know, then he would, no! You know, that's how you go after those people when you interrogate them, because pride and ego down forces them to defend, and they become larger than life to show you how big they are. Works well. Okay, going going to what Joe Navarro calls um, verbal bridging, and we so we always talk about that. That opens it up for those, those micro, um, yes. yeah. So talk so talk about bridging, that a little bit. Verbal bridging is nothing more than hiding time, using words to to jump over space. And I think Schaefer and Navarro together came up with that. But mm -hmm. I guess I remember I was working with Schaefer when when they brought that to us, and we were teaching agencies. But words like and then after that, so. Words like that allow you to skip over time. So the way they showed us is they would give you a video of a guy walking in a store, stealing some food or some alcohol as he left, and then say, write a statement about what you just saw as if you're the person. And almost to the person, every person said, I went in the store, I looked around, I went to buy a soda, decided I didn't want one, and then left to the person. So it's a way to hide information that you don't want other people to hear. 
And there can be other ways as well, but it's just simply a way of hiding information because language is only part of how we are, we think, but remembering that your first language patterns, your brain. So English has a certain methodology and the way you hide information is designed by that language. If you spoke Chinese, you would hide it a different way. It's just the way, way we're structured. Who drives the Bentley? Mm, my driver. Who's your driver? Um, I have a number of drivers. So you would say um, James or Cliff, uh, and they're responsible for picking up our, um, our guests in those cars that fly in for meetings and things like that. And the same thing with the 2007 Mercedes-Benz? Yes. 2008 BMW? Yes. Are those owned outright or subject to any kind of loan? Uh, they're owned. Outright? There's no loan on those? No. Okay. When you come to Michigan. There you have it. Four videos that let you know when someone's lying to you. That We've shown you the things to look for, some of the things to look for. When you think someone's being deceptive and you start seeing these things, you're, you may see very small versions of these. You don't want to look for just one. You want to look for three, four of those things. So that's when you can start saying, wait a minute, something's not right here. When you see the first one, you go, hey, heads up. When you see the second one, you go, okay, here we go. And you see the third one, you go, all right, it's on. So make sure you don't just see the one and go, oh, that person's lying. Uh, and I know why, and here's why. That's an absolute. You want to pick more than one, two, or three. Get in there and get a group of them. So now if you like what we're doing, subscribe to our channel. Hit the like button down there. And down there on, there you go, right down there where Mark's pointing, hit that subscribe button and I'll subscribe to the channel. Usually we get these out on Thursdays, but sometimes we come out early on Wednesdays for people who've subscribed, they'll know. So if you want to see um, what we've done as early as possible, hit that subscribe button and hit the little bell and it'll let you know as soon as we put one out. All right, we good? Yeah. Good. Right, there's one see in the can. See you guys next time. The behavior panel. Oh, Chase is gone. We know how long wow. Wow. <laughs> she lasted a little. Oh, that's his camera. Yeah. That's, that's it. It's fried. It's fried. Oh, wow. Perfect, man. <laughs>